Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a great show for you tonight. Mike Bush is here from Savvy Aviation, and of course, we are going to be talking about annual inspections. Before I get started, a couple quick notes about the show. First of all, uh, of course, uh, Social Flight is what's bringing you the show. Be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. We have tens of thousands of events, online events and real life events, which is so great to see that they're starting to happen again. We're seeing uh, lots of different events happening around the country with safe social distancing, where people can come in and, and start to see aircraft again and, and share aviation in person, which is is great as long as it's done safely of course and it also supports all of our local businesses and FBOs and so uh, we're huge huge fans here at Social Flight about making all of that happen. In addition a couple other notes uh, first of all tonight's broadcast will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel usually it takes us about 24 hours to get that recording out to you so feel free to check that out as well. If you're watching tonight on a mobile device then uh, you can actually swipe left and right if you need to change the size of any of the uh, uh, screens or be able to see uh, things a little bit clear between our, uh, our speaker and uh, ourselves, myself. So uh, with that, uh, again, uh, thank you and let's get started. I would like to bring on the line Mike Bush to join us. Mike is arguably the best known AMPIA in general aviation. He runs the, writes the monthly Savvy Maintenance column for AOPA Pilot, hosts free monthly maintenance webinars with EAA, et cetera. It co-founded AvWeb in 1995 and, of course, is most known for being the uh, founder and CEO of Savvy Aviation. Mike, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Jeff. How are you? Excellent. Thank Looks you like so much. Looks like we've got a, a great turnout tonight. Oh, yeah, and it's uh, growing. We're going to probably hit our cap here. For anyone who doesn't make it in here or if for some reason you get kicked out and can't get back in, because, of course, we do have an attendance limit, um, again, you can go to that recording. So with that, Mike, let's get started talking about annual inspections, and I'd like to kick it off with what seems to be kind of the most basic of basics, but we all get these questions, and that is the annual inspection is an inspection and just an inspection. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and why that causes so much confusion and heartburn throughout general aviation? Right, well, there's, a, there's this misconception that the annual inspection is something that is supposed to make your airplane airworthy. Um, that's actually something, I, I have a, a, a term for that just to help the confusion. I call it the annual ordeal. Uh, and, and the annual inspection is the first part of the annual ordeal, but it's not the whole ordeal. The annual inspection is, is, is basically a pass-fail exam. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an exam we always fail. Nobody ever passes it. Uh, because th there's pretty much no such thing as 100% airworthy aircraft. Um, so uh, the inspection part of the inspection is is where uh, an appropriately rated person, usually an IA, um, does a, a very comprehensive visual inspection of the aircraft. In theory inspects every molecule and atom of the airplane and makes an airworthiness determination. Now, in theory, that airworthiness determination could be the airplane is 100% airworthy. Uh, but it never is. <laughs> so typically the airworthiness de de determination um, uh, results in a discrepancy list that says I, everything is fine with the airplane except these things. Um, and at that point, the annual inspection um, really should, should end. The, 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 right. con the conclusion of an annual inspection should be that the IA uh hands the owner a discrepancy list and an invoice for the ins for the inspection which is usually done on a flat rate basis and puts on his hat and coat and goes home um now at that point the aircraft owner um doesn't really have to do anything uh, unless he wants to fly the airplane again if he wants to fly the airplane again he he has to get the airworthiness discrepancies resolved 
Right. Be because, you know, we have this little pesky rule called 91-7 that says no person may uh, may, may operate an, an aircraft unless it's in airworthy condition. So um, in, in theory, the owner could then take his airplane to somebody else and say, right. here's a list of what's wrong with it. Would you fix it, please? Yeah, but let's, not, let's, let's, let's pause there for one second because okay. I think what's, there's something really, really important in what you said that I want to drive home because we all see it in the world of maintenance. And that is that logbook entry you've just talked about, because as you as you just said, there's two options, right? This aircraft is found to be in airworthy condition, you know, the statement that has, goes in there, or a list of discrepancies has been provided to the owner. The, there's no non-airworthy and staying in my shop concept. Well, there 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 is no such concept in the regulations. However, in in real life, you know, 98% of the time. Um, the 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 shop that does the inspection is also uh, hired by the owner to uh, to correct the discrepancies, and a very peculiar thing goes on. Uh, and uh, I'd say it's peculiar because, you know, if if I were FAA administrator for the day, I would change this. But but what happens most of the time is that the uh, the IA completes the inspection, and instead of signing off the annual as unairworthy with a discrepancy list, he, he sort of gives a memorandum to the owner, an informal thing, a non-regulatory thing, that says, here's what I found wrong, would you like me to fix it? And the owner usually says, yeah, go ahead and fix it. And then the IA takes off his IA hat, puts on his A&P hat, fixes the discrepancies, takes off his A&P hat, puts his IA hat back on, walks around the airplane again and says, my God, it's a miracle. The airplane is 100% airworthy and, 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 and gives an airworthy sign off. Now, that's a really peculiar state of affairs if you think about it. Um, oh, yeah. It, and, and, uh, and I think that it is, it, it it has the potential for being a corrupt state of affairs. Uh, in, you know, you know, I, I live in California and uh, we have, you know, smog regulations where, where our cars have to have to go through um, smog tests every couple of years. Th there are two kinds of smog uh, test stations in California. There's one kind that does testing only and, and, and gives you a report and says either you passed or you didn't pass, but they don't fix anything. So if, if you don't pass and you have to go to, to some repair station and get your, get, get your car fixed so that it, so that it'll pass the smog test. The, the other kind of smog repair station uh, fixes what's wrong. Now, who do you suppose gives the more honest test results? You know, <laughs> if it were me, I would want to take my car to the one that that doesn't have a dog in the fight, that that you know doesn't make a profit, but from finding things wrong. Um, well, you know the 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 situation in aviation is really really the same. Uh, by rights, a, an inspection should be just an inspection. I I lost your image, Jeff, but. Yeah, we lost uh, camera for a second for some oh, reason. We lost my camera too. Okay. Let's bring those back and see what, uh, not sure quite what happened. There we go. Oh, sorry. I was turning yeah. your camera back on and uh, <laughs> I did the same. We're dan dancing around. Okay, we're all back. <laughs> are, are, we, are we done with that? <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. Um, so keep going. But. Uh, so you know the way things are done in general aviation, um, the the inspectors have an have an expectation that they will also be the fixers, mm -hmm. and as a result, I I think that the the inspectors tend to be a little biased towards uh, declaring things airworthiness discrepancies, mm. um, and. You know the the my company manages 
uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of annual inspections every year. And, and you know, and, and we wind up pushing back against the shop a lot and, and, and say, you know, is that really an airworthiness discrepancy? And a lot of the time they say, well, I guess not. But, right. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it seems to me it, it go it, it also becomes even more kind of a sort of pseudo corrupt because um, it becomes a negotiation, right? I mean, the, the IA ends up saying, well, I'll sign it off if you do this, but I'll let you, I'll let you go another year with this thing. It's got some wear and I want to see you do something about it, but fix this one and I'm okay with it. And I'll let you go another year with this one. Like how many times do we hear those conversations? Like yeah. you end up, you end up deciding what passes and what fails and it's connected to the inspection. And, and that doesn't seem right at all. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And like I say, if, if I were administrator for the day, I would, I would change things so that it, basically every annual inspection w was an unairworthy sign off with a list of discrepancies mm -hmm. just to make it very explicit that the, that, that, that the aircraft owner is the person who's supposed to be in control of, of, of what to fix and how to fix it. Right. Uh, not the well, guy who does the inspection. So the logbook entry itself, I think, often tells the tale of that, doesn't it? I mean, we see the most common logbook entries are ones that begin with a list of repairs that were done to the aircraft. Like, that's the beginning. Mm -hmm. And ends with the statement of, I find this aircraft to be in airward in this condition, blah, 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 blah. Like, literally, the cart is before the horse. Right, exactly. And, and of course, that logbook entry really doesn't reveal anything about uh, which of those things were, were, were really airworthiness discrepancies and which ones were things that the owner just decided to do on a discretionary basis. Now, does the list of discrepancies, though, belong in the logbooks? The, the list of discrepancies uh, should never be in the logbooks. There should never be... Uh, uh, any discrepancy recorded in the logbook. Um, and that's, a, that's something that we have a problem with a lot of mechanics because a lot of mechanics want to write discrepancies in logbooks. And when, when we're managing the maintenance of a client's aircraft, if the mechanic puts discrepancies in the logbook entry, we send the logbook entry back and tell them to redo it. Be because what the regulation requires is is a, a statement of the work performed. There's nothing in the regulation that requires discrepancies to be recorded in logbooks. And a statement of work performed is really kind of a positive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, a statement of discrepancy is a negative thing. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's put, putting discrepancies in, in the logbook is almost like libeling the aircraft in a way. <laughs> um, and, and because the FAA doesn't require it, um, in fact, it, it's it's interesting. If, if an annual inspection is signed off uh, with discrepancies, the regulation requires that a uh, specific wording in the logbook that says, uh, I've inspected this aircraft in accordance with uh, um, annual inspection and a list of discrepancies and unairworthy items has been given to the owner slash operator. That's what the logbook entry says. And the list of discrepancies, which we call a, 40, uh, a 4311 list because that's the regulation that, that uh, requires it, um, that list of discrepancies should always be on a separate piece of paper signed and dated by the, by the IA. And the reason it should always be on a separate piece of paper and not in the logbook is because if you look at the regulation that talks about retention of maintenance record entries, um, which is, uh, I think it's 91417, if memory serves, um, it says that the logbook entry for an annual inspection, for any inspection, has to be kept for a minimum of one year. Um, but the 4311 discrepancy list has to be kept until the discrepancies have been corrected, which pre presumably isn't going to take a year. So the, 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 
the FAA is implying in that regulation that the two should be separate because one can be tossed away as soon as the discrepancies are corrected and the other has to be retained for a year. Right. Uh, and, and so and the put, discrepancy, putting the discrepancy list mentioned. in a logbook entry would make it very hard to comply with that. And and that list that you talked about, shouldn't that in itself have two separate sections having to do with what is a discrepancy and what is an airworthiness issue? Well, the, the that that list really should only have airworthiness issues on it because that list is a regulatory list. Okay. Um, the, 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 a list of non-airworthiness issues really ought to be a memorandum. Uh, so, be, so essentially, be, you should wind up with three things, if I hear you correctly. You should wind up with the logbook entry, which contains no substantive data about what was found. You should have the 4311 list, which are only airworthiness discrepancies provided separately to the owner. Mm -hmm. And then some other document of memorandum that is the IA's feedback, thoughts, or whatever on things that they do not consider to be airworthy, but that they are recommendations, perhaps uh, advice or uh, liability reasons they want to say this is, you know, going on, whatever it is. Sure, sure. What about compressions? Do those belong? <laughs> in, in, where do those go? I know, I know, I know how you feel about compressions, and I'm with you. <laughs> but where do they go, regardless? Well, traditionally, they're recorded in in the annual inspection logbook entry. There's no requirement for for them to to be recorded. Uh, for some reason, it's a long, proud tradition, and I can't ever remember seeing an annual inspection uh, 4311 logbook uh, logbook entry that didn't have the compressions recorded. But there's nothing anywhere that requires it. What, what's required is a description of the work performed. And one item of work is I performed a compression test. There, there isn't any requirement to, you know, it, 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 if you had to record the results of, of all the inspections you do, then like if you did a borescope inspection of the cylinders, you'd have to attach the photographs to the logbook. I mean, nobody <laughs> does that. Right. Um, but for some reason, uh, recording the um, uh, the uh, compression results in the logbook entry is, is, is a traditional thing to do. Um, I, I mean, I think it should be recorded informally because you'd like to be able to compare with last year and the year before and things like that. But there's no regulatory reason those things should be in the logbook entry. It's just kind of traditionally that they are. Mm. It's kind of interesting uh, how many, you know, where that line is drawn, because there's so many items that actually, you know, probably just, just through, like you said, the way that people have done it over the years, get an entry and then that the entry has the results attached to it where that really doesn't seem to be necessary. Like you don't really have to say tests okay. Cause like you said, there's like a hundred other, other inspections they did, they could have written are okay and they don't. You know, the interesting question is, why do we make logbook entries at all? No, I mean, I, I don't mean the obvious answer that is the regulations require it, but what, what, what was, what's the whole idea? Who's supposed to be the beneficiary of these logbook entries? In, in my mind, the beneficiary of the logbook entries is the owner operator, mm -hmm. because the owner operator is the person who's responsible for maintaining the aircraft in airworthy condition. Yep. Um, so if you, if, if you write something nasty, gratuitously nasty in a logbook entry, which we see a lot, we always send them back when, when we see them, um, is, is that, you know, does that benefit the owner? Really shouldn't no, but it, it goes back really to what you said. Writing stuff in the logbook entries that's, that, that's detrimental to the owner. Well, as you mentioned earlier, I think it's incredibly important. I want to hit that again, saying those negative items of anything, I don't see how that's helpful. I can see the positive side of when did I change those tires last? And you go in and you find the one that says, new tires added, here's the date, here's the number of hours on the aircraft. You know, but it 
what's the point of left tire bald and showing whatever? Because as yeah. soon as you finished writing that, that tire's in a scrapyard. You're never going to see it. It's not like, hey, wait, I know you. You're a bad tire. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, you know, the the, uh, the 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 other one I always hear, and this is this is kind of an interesting part of this discussion is um, when we run into a mechanic, let, let's say let's say that we we direct a, 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 an IA to sign off an annual of discrepancies for some reason. And there are a lot of good reasons for doing that, by the way. We can talk about that. But let, let's suppose we, we direct him to sign off the annual of discrepancies. And he says, okay, and he insists on writing the discrepancies in the logbook, which, of course, we're not going to, to tolerate. And we say, you're not supposed to do that. And most of the time, what the IA will say in response to that is, I have to write it in the logbook. Otherwise, how can I be sure that the next mechanic will know what the discrepancies were? And the answer is, you don't. That's not your affair. You were hired to do an inspection. You're not the safety police. You're not supposed to follow the, that airplane in, into the future to figure out you know, what the owner is doing with it. You did your job. You you were asked to to inspect the aircraft, make an airworthiness determination. You made the determination. You documented the determination. Your job is done, except for you know submitting an invoice. Your your job is done. Right. It's not your responsibility to the airworthiness of the aircraft is not your responsibility. It's the owner's responsibility. Yep. And and that's the thing that just seems to get lost a lot, is the fact that mechanics are not responsible for airworthiness. Owners are responsible for airworthiness. Right. They are only responsible in the, with that using that word with the airworthiness of the particular task they performed. Well, and, and if they're hired to do an inspection, they're they're responsible for 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 making an airworthiness determination. Let let's talk about that for a minute because I think that's important too. I mean, one of the big challenges with uh, when you hear bad stories of annuals is that uh, lots and lots of time passes. And I know from when I got my IA and talking to lots of FAA guys that there isn't, an, there isn't anyone at the FAA I've ever met that, that, that thinks there's anything okay with an with a inspection that is not uh, succinct and, uh, ex and, and efficient, expeditious from beginning to end, that the idea that, a, that an aircraft you know, goes through three or six months sitting in the corner of a shop and the annual began, you know, four months ago and ended later is all of a sudden okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a key thing that, for, to talk about as well. There, there's actually, I wish I knew the number of it, but there's actually an advisory circular that says that. That, that says it, it's an advisory circular that's sort of directed towards IAs. And, and one of the things that it says is if, if you do an annual inspection and the correction is expected to take a long time, you should sign off the annual as unairworthy with a discrepancy list. You shouldn't just hold it open and have right. it be a, you know, an inspection that took six months. Right. Um, again, that advice is not followed very often. And it, it, as in the advisory circular is not regulatory, so you can't it, you know, the FAA can't lock you up for taking six months to complete an annual, but uh, but but it's clearly not what the FAA's intent was. No, um, and it can cause real issues. I mean, I've I have stories of you know customers and friends who have had things that have taken six months, and then there's a squawk that happens on the first flight that was signed off like, oh, this was just inspected. Yeah. And the reality was it was inspected six months ago. Months ago. Like, uh -huh. You know, the gear was swung six months ago and the airplane's been sitting on jacks for six months. And uh, no, you have no idea if you put it back down on the struts that they're not all of a sudden going to go flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. So, I mean, what what is the most common issue that you deal with? Is it is it where the line gets blurred for shops releasing aircraft? What 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 do you what do you find you and Savvy get called upon the most having to do with annual inspections? Oh wow! Um, well, the, there you know there is this 
this pervasive misunderstanding about who is responsible for what. Um, and aircraft owners tend to not take responsibility for all the stuff that they're supposed to take responsibility for. They tend to allow their mechanics to, to, to take that responsibility. And mechanics uh, tend to be willing to, to, to do that. And that's not in anybody's best interest uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if mechanics make decisions that owners are supposed to make, the, the owner is frequently not happy with, with the outcome of that decision because the, me the mechanic has a whole different uh, calculus uh, th that goes behind the, the decisions he makes. Me mechanics um, have, the owners and mechanics have a common objective in that they both want the aircraft to be safe, but they have very divergent objectives in, in other respects. Um, Mechanics want to minimize their liability, and owners tend to to want to minimize their maintenance expense. And those two things tend to pull in the opposite direction. So among other things, if, if owners allow mechanics to make decisions, typically their aircraft will be over-maintained uh, and their maintenance expense will be higher than it needs to be. Um, but you know, one of the things that mechanics don't seem to understand is, is that the more they make decisions on th that owners properly should be making, the more liability they're taking on. Um, the, the, you know, they really should be in, a, in this mode of saying to the aircraft owner, here's what I found, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. But most of the time they don't do that. Most of the time they say, here's, here's what I found and here's what I have to do, which basically, you know, take, takes all of the discretion away from the aircraft owner and puts all the liability onto the mechanic. But, but most mechanics don't think about that, the, the fact that they're taking on, they, they tend to be very liability averse, but they, they don't think it through to the point of saying, you know, every time I make a decision, uh, I'm taking on liability, uh, and those decisions are really supposed to be the aircraft owner's decisions. Right. Mechanics, are, mechanics are supposed to advise the aircraft owner. They're supposed to give them their professional opinion, but they're not supposed to be making decisions as to what to do. So we're getting a lot of questions that are flying in right now that some of which are really on the same topic. And I think that there seems to be some clarification required because you mentioned it, you, you hit it like the aircraft owner and or operator is required for the airworthiness of the aircraft. And so you have an annual inspection completed a list of discrepancies is provided to the owner or operator. Mm -hmm. And then they do what they are supposed to do, have those addressed. And, and, and so many people are asking the question, yes, but how is that shown? Where's the paper trail for that? Where's the, where's the whole, how do I know it all got done uh, and if this list resided with the owner and then they decided what to do with it? Where's the airworthy, this is now airworthy uh, logbook entry? Who's asking this question? You say, how about do I know? Who's, about who's, 20 people. <laughs> no, but I'm saying, who's the I that's asking this question? How do I know? Exactly. I mean, the aircraft owner clearly knows. That's right. And he's think, the only I person think, who's supposed everyone's to know. Everyone's operating. I think every, all our viewers are operating under the concern for others or the watchdog of safety hat. Right. And, it, you know, I, I, I don't know how many times I've I've had a conversation with a mechanic that said, Hey, if you want to be the safety police, quit your job and go to work for the FAA cuz those are the guys who are the safety police. As an A&P or IA, you're not part of the safety police. You are a contractor and who hires you as an aircraft owner. Right. And your your allegiance is supposed to be to the aircraft owner, not to not to some overarching, you know, safety thing. The, yep. the, and the aircraft owner hires you for two very different sorts of things. He may hire you as an A&P to perform work on his aircraft. 
or he may hire you as an IA to inspect the aircraft. And when he hires you as an IA, your job is to inspect the aircraft and give him a discrepancy list. Right. And when he hires you as an A&P to do work on the aircraft, your job is to do that work in in a satisfactory fashion that's in compliance with the with manufacturer's guidance generally and 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 uh, and is compliant with with all of the regulations in part 43 um so you're supposed to do the job properly that he hired you to do but you're not supposed to do stuff that he didn't hire you to do <laughs> yes now is the aircraft still uh under its last annual inspection if it is not yet expired when that entry is made or do you need a a ferry permit no matter what once a discrepancy list exists um this is this is this is a thing that confuses a lot of people and and the 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 simplest way of looking at it is this the act of committing maintenance grounds an aircraft it always, any maintenance grounds an aircraft. And ins, an inspection is one kind of maintenance, okay? So the act of inspecting an aircraft, now now that isn't just a look-see, like, hey, hey, Fred, come over and take a look at this and let me know what you think. That's not an inspection. An inspection is an annual inspection, a 100-hour inspection, a progressive inspection, a regulatory inspection. But an inspection is one kind of maintenance. Any act of maintenance from an oil change to an annual inspection grounds the aircraft. And what ungrounds the aircraft is a signature by an appropriately rated person. And who is appropriately rated to unground the aircraft depends on what maintenance was performed. If it was an oil change performed by the aircraft owner, then it's the aircraft owner's signature that ungrounds the aircraft. If it's a, you know, if it's a replacing a shock strut, then it's an A&P signature. If it is performing an annual inspection, then it is a, an IA signature. But the basic concept is any active maintenance grounds an aircraft and what ungrounds the aircraft is a signature by an, by, by an appropriately authorized person. So in this case, we've got uh, the annual inspection is, uh, let's go through an example. Annual inspection is complete. A list of discrepancies is provided to the owner. The owner's handed this piece of paper. It's got four items on it. And um, at that point, the owner, of course, responsible for the airworthiness of the aircraft. Now, this is this is just... To, to clarify, this is an annual that was signed off as unairworthy with a four-item discrepancy list. Correct. Okay. Now the the owner decides wants to wants to have the work done at a different airport. Mm -hmm. They have to do a ferry permit, I assume, uh, and talk to the FAA about transporting the aircraft. The, the yeah, if you if if you want to fly an unairworthy aircraft, um, you have to have a ferry permit. Yep. And so they work, presumably, of course, with, with the shop they're taking it to, who can help them with that and coordinate that uh, that ferry permit uh, to get the aircraft over to the new shop. Well, the shop doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with it. Okay. Uh, the applicant for a ferry permit is always the owner. Got it. It's never the shop. Now, one of the requirements for a ferry permit, well, an almost requirement for a ferry permit, is a safe to fly logbook entry by an A&P mechanic. It's a logbook entry that says, I know this airplane is unairworthy, but in my but I have looked at it and in my opinion it is safe to make a 15 minute flight or with the proposed ferry flight whatever it is. Yep. Um and that's a very low standard. Yes. Uh, the, yeah, the, people can the, do it with a retractable gear aircraft that doesn't work and the gear's down yeah. and locked for the flight. Right. There's all sorts of, yeah. Uh, but but if you don't have an A&P give you a safe-to-fly logbook entry, 
then the only other way to get a ferry permit is to have an FAA inspector come out and look at the aircraft. And trust me, you do not want that. So, <laughs> so from all practical, from a practical standpoint, you, you always need a safe to fly entry by some A&P. Right. And it doesn't need to be the A&P that did the annual inspection. It can be any old A&P. Right. In fact, in fact, it may very well be that you want an A&P from the shop to whom you're taking the aircraft to, right. to do that safe to fly. Which is com which actually I've seen more often than not. Yeah. It it be where you're taking it to. So we so we go that the aircraft operator gets the gets the ferry permit hops the plane over 15 miles to another airport to, so, to get that work done. Um, now he, using the new shop that he prefers to use now for this maintenance, goes over these four items and that shop addresses, let's say, let's say they look at out of those four items in our, in our theoretical example. Three of them they're gonna fix, no problem. And one of them they look at and they say, I, I just disagree. I think this is airworthy. I don't think this is an issue. Um, at that point, you're just getting entries of the work performed and that's it because the aircraft owner is the one managing it? Yes, but let, let's talk a little bit about that, that, that one that, um, that was, that the annual, the IA thought was unairworthy, but this other shop thinks is airworthy. Um, that that discrepancy needs to be cleared in some explicit way. Okay. So the, the usual way of clearing a non-discrepancy discrepancy is by doing an inspection. Okay. And 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 making a determination that the that the item in question is airworthy. Excellent. So there so so they look at something with an objective standard. The objection let's say the owner has sit there and says I left the shop because that uh, I just they couldn't give me definitive data as to what's acceptable and what isn't, and they just said this corrosion is is non airworthy. You get to the new shop, you're saying as long as the new shop can put something in there that says inspected wing rib, blah blah blah, the corrosion damage cleaned up and, or whatever or inspected does not exceed X Y and Z. Here's the parameters. Therefore, it's airworthy. That so that's how you clear it up. They have to put something objective in there about why they think something's actually okay? Um, well, I'm not saying that they have to put a, a, a lot of data in there. I'm just saying that they have to say that they inspected it and found it airworthy. Okay. Let, let, me, give you, let me give you an example that comes up a lot. Owner brings his aircraft into a shop for an annual inspection. The airplane has an engine that's 400 hours past TBO. The IA performs the annual inspection and says, I can't sign this aircraft off as airworthy. It has an engine that's 400 hours over TBO. That comes up? Oh, oh, that happens all the time, Jeff. Wow. The owner, the owner says, well, wait a minute. Um, the, the, there's no requirement for a Part 91 operator to comply with TBO or any other manufacturer specified overhaul or replacement or inspection interval. Uh, the only time that that would be required by a Part 91 operator is if it was either an airworthiness limitation or mandated by AD, and it's and that's not the case. And the IA says quite properly, yes, but I was hired to do an airworthiness determination. Air, now, uh, by the way, the, this conversation would never happen in this level of detail, but <laughs> bear with me here. <laughs> right. um, and for something to be airworthy, it has to meet two criteria. It, it, it has to comply with its type design and it has to be in condition for safe operation. And I'm not saying that the engine doesn't comply with its type design. I'm not saying that TBO is part of the type design of the engine. I'm saying I don't feel that an engine over TBO is in condition for safe operation. And that's a totally subjective standard. Right. So I'm entitled to say I'm not comfortable signing this off as airworthy, which is true. The IA 
mm-hmm. is was within his discretion to say, I'm not going to sign off an engine as airworthy that's past TBO. So the owner says, well, you know, I, I believe in reliability centered maintenance. This engine is just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It, the, it's got good compression. It's got good oil consumption. The, the filter was clean. The, the oil analysis was clean. The borescope inspection looked great. Um, and I don't have any intention of overhauling this engine. And the IA says, well, I don't have any intention of signing the engine off as airworthy. So, okay, so these guys are, are going to have to agree to disagree, right? So, so what, 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 what's the resolution? The resolution is that the owner directs the IA to sign off the annual with a discrepancy on the engine. Now, that's a very interesting state of affairs right there, because what's the IA going to write on the discrepancy list? You know, it's one thing to say, I'm not comfortable with it. It's another thing to, to write down something on, on, on a regulatory document, like a 4311 discrepancy list. What's he going to do? <laughs> so nine times out of 10, what the IA is going to say is he's going to realize that he's sort of in a very uncomfortable position now. And he's going to say, okay, I'll sign it off this time, but don't bring it back next year and expect me to sign it off. And the owner's going to say, don't worry, I'm not planning to. And that's the end of that. But let's suppose that, that this was a particularly dogmatic IA who says, uh, I'm, I'm going to sign it off with the discrepancy. And he, Signs, it off, signs off the annuals on Airworthy and hands the owner a discrepancy list that says engine is over TBO. So, so now the, the owner takes the, the airplane out of his shop. Now, how's he gonna clear the discrepancy? Well, the easiest way to clear the discrepancy is to find some A&P who has his head screwed on right and say, would you please perform a 100 hour inspection on my engine? Hmm. And and the hundred hour inspection is going to take, you know, ninety minutes, and uh, and I mean it's sort of silly to be doing that because um, he's going to cut open an oil filter that has zero hours on it, and he's going to do it, you know. But 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 he's going to go through the motions, and he's going to declare the engine is airworthy, and that clears the discrepancy, and the owner's back in the air. So, the, but but that's that that's a a case that comes up quite a bit that we run into IAs that aren't comfortable signing off engines that are over TBO. Interesting. And the resolution of that is to say, okay, sign it off with a discrepancy. And a lot of the time, the the the, the IA will realize that he sort of painted himself into a funny corner, and and he'll go ahead and sign off the annual under protest. But but even if he doesn't, it's very easy to resolve, you know, resolve the, the problem. But you feel the best resolution is a hundred hour inspection by a different mechanic then? They still have to go through all that, even if the only well, item on the description discrepancy list is engine beyond manufacturer's recommended TBO. Like well, that's the line. Imagine you're the you're the the A and P number two, okay, and somebody comes to you with this situation. And is asking you to clear the discrepancy. Um, are, are you going to feel comfortable clearing the discrepancy? No, never even at looking all. at the at the aircraft. You probably aren't. Oh, not at all. What what comes to mind, and what I was wondering during that though, is that since there are since there are many cases where the owner can legally clear the discrepancy if it's within preventive maintenance, let's say, or something like that. Can the owner not clear this one if the only issue is TBO? Well, I don't see how he can. Hmm. I mean, for, first of all, an owner is not permitted by regulation to perform any sort of inspection. Right. Well, there, I'll, I'll, I'll take that back. There are a few very obscure inspections that owners are permitted to do for example on the, the on the Cessna oil filter adapter there's an AD that says that one of the things you have to do periodically is to inspect the the torque seal on the retaining nut 
and see if it's broken. And it explicitly says this may be done by by by, by a pilot rated aircraft owner. Mm. Uh, but there are very very few cases like that. The general rule is that owners are not are not permitted to do inspections. Have you found um, cases where shops differ when it comes to things like leaks, whether it be oil or fuel, et cetera? You mean Especially as when to, you're dealing with tanks as, or things as like to that. whether it's an airworthiness discrepancy? Yes. Oh, uh, oh, certainly, of course. Um, again, the uh, most mechanics tend to err on the extremely conservative side. But for example, for fuel leaks, there there is good guidance in, in AC forty three thirteen uh, that that classifies leaks into five different categories and and you know indicates which of those categories represents airworthiness items. So there is a sort of an objective standard you can go to. Yeah, but some shops don't like objective standards. <laughs> yeah, no, but, I mean the, 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 there are just a lot of uh, a lot of, of mechanics who are perfectionists and, and that's a two edged sword. You know, it, it's, I, I would like a mechanic to be a perfectionist when he's doing an inspection. I particularly like him to be a perfectionist when he's doing a pre-buy, but, but I don't want him, that just means he's got a really good set of eyes and he's very thorough, but I don't want him to, to classify everything as an airworthiness issue. I'd like him to catch all sorts of stuff and have eight out of 10 of those things be discretionary. Right. So, you know, I found this, do you want to do something about it? It's up, it's your call. Right. But, but unfortunately there is, seems to be a tendency for, uh, for, for IAs to classify almost everything as airworthiness. And, and, and then only if the owner argues about it, does he say, well, okay, maybe I can deescalate this to a, to a discretionary discrepancy rather than an airworthiness item. Right. Now, I know you've got like your kind of top list uh, of, of types of things for owners to, to be able to protect themselves. And, and one of them is not handing over your logbooks. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, we we in, instruct our clients to never let their, their original logbooks leave their custody and control. We, we like to see them locked up in a safe somewhere. Um, and never given to any shop, never even given to an FA inspector. Because there's no reason. It, if if you have an incident and and, and an FA inspector says, uh, you know, I I I want a copy of your maintenance record entries. I I want to see your maintenance record entries. Um, there's no reason in the world that 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 a photocopy of those re maintenance record entries does not suffice for for that. Um, th then there are a whole bunch of reasons that the maintenance record entry should not leave the owner's custody and control. Um, for one, we never want anybody writing anything in the logbooks. We always want all maintenance record entries made on self-adhesive stickers. That's why God made hell self-adhesive <laughs> stickers. Uh, and the reason for that is so that we can review the logbook entry and if it's inappropriate, we can send it back and for a do-over. But if, if they write directly in the log book, it's hard to, to get a do-over. And it's amazing how often we find inappropriate things in log book entries that, that, that need to be sent, ba sent back. So that's one reason. A, a second reason is, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen situations where an owner and a shop get in, into a dispute over an invoice and the shop decides it's gonna hold the logbooks hostage until the bill is paid. Well, you don't want that to happen. So a good way is to not give them anything to hold hostage. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, was, I, was, I saw uh, there was a case some years ago where um, there was a flood at Corona Airport in Southern California and the shops on the field and, and there were, there were thousands of aircraft owners that had left maintenance logs on file at the shop, which is a terrible thing to do. Uh, and they were all destroyed in the flood. Mm. Um, and, and so all of these aircraft got, got devalued. A lot of them weren't even at the airport, but, 
but the logbooks were, were, you know, were gone. Wow. So when we take on a managed maintenance client, the, the first thing we do is get the logbook scanned and maintain a, a digital copy of, of the logbooks. And um, the digital copy is what we provide the shops. We, we never provide sense. the shops the original. And that also is, is a good protection. So if anything ever did happen to the originals, uh, the, there's there, the digital copy still exists. Right. Uh, and, you don't and, you don't also this is a slightly different subject but you don't ever want the the logbooks to be carried in the airplane right uh the ntsb doesn't want you to because if the airplane crashes they don't want the records to burn up mm -hmm. and your lawyer doesn't want you to because if you get ramp checked you know you, you you don't want those maintenance records to be available to the faa until you've had a chance to go over and make sure all the i's are dotted and the t's are crossed and then <laughs> And so on. So uh, right. yeah, you never want to carry maintenance records in the aircraft. Now I know, obviously, and we'll talk about this uh, uh, in uh, following this. But obviously, uh, savvy maintenance is a great source for getting tons of these answers done. But for the average owner who may not be your your, your client yet, what, how do they get these? How do they determine? what is an airworthiness issue and what isn't when they're being told things that cause trouble. I'll give you examples. Um, you know, when people aren't following inspection recommendations based on like 500 hour mag inspections, other types of things that are uh, perhaps not an, an airworthiness discrepancy at 501 hours that should make an aircraft unairworthy. But how did they know other than what they're being told? Well. I Again, the if 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 an IA um, states that you have an airworthiness discrepancy, and you, you're not particularly comfortable with that, you don't think it's an airworthiness discrepancy. Um, th there are a couple of steps that you can take. The first step, the first thing you ought to do is ask the IA what makes it an airworthiness discrepancy? Because as we talked about just before, there are two, two things that can make something an airworthiness discrepancy. One is nonconformance with type design. For example, the brake disc was micrometered and it was below the minimum thickness. That, that's a, that's a, a hard departure from type design because the type design includes a minimum thickness. It's written right down in the book. And so, you know that 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 should be pretty indisputable. E either it either it mics below above the minimum or it doesn't mic above the minimum. Everybody should agree on that. Um, or, you know, with a Lycoming engine, if if the compression is less than sixty over eighty, uh, it's it's non airworthy. With for Continentals, it's a lot fuzzier than that. But um, the other thing that can make a, an item an airworthiness item is if in the opinion of the inspector, it is not um, in condition for safe flight. And that's a completely subjective standard. Right. Um, so if it's a subjective determination, then the, the best thing to to do if it's, if it's an objective determination, then the IA should be able to de dem demonstrate what you know measurement or specification was not being complied with, and then there really shouldn't be an, an, anything to argue about because it's, it's it's a black and white situation. If it's one of these subjective things that I don't consider that in condition for safe flight, like the engine that's 400 hours over TBO, for example. Um, then what you want to do is is get a second opinion or maybe a third opinion uh, and get it from somebody who has recognized expertise uh, for example I i've done a lot of, of tech um, rep work for for type clubs cessna pilots association american bonanza society Cirrus owners and pilots association um, and you can typically find extremely knowledgeable people there who whose opinion hopefully your mechanic will give some weight to mm -hmm. and if and if if 
they feel it's not an airworthiness discrepancy, then have them, you know, write you a letter saying that much or, or have even better have them call your mechanic and say, you know, so-and-so asked me to give you a call because, and, and get into a discussion with him. Frequently, if you can get another mechanic to to weigh in, the, 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 then the IA will probably give more weight to the other mechanic's opinion than, than he will to, to the aircraft owner's opinion. It's, yep. That's probably it, not it, the way it ought to be, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> It um, seems like one of the, the situations that I've I've seen a lot, uh, people are writing in about it as well. You know, we constantly hit up against this thing. You you keep talking about TBO on the engine level, absolutely. But when you start talking about recommended inspections or recommended overhauls or recommended any of these things that apply to all sorts of components and accessories through the aircraft, mm -hmm. that's where a lot of people, you know, end up in, at odds with their IA where it's not that the IA is saying there's anything demonstrable that makes it unairworthy. They're just saying, I'm not going to sign it off as airworthy past this recommended inspection because I don't know without yeah. opening it up. These See, mags not, have 700 I'm, I'm, hours on them. They haven't been opened up. I'm not comfortable signing them off as airworthy, even though there's no squawk on them and they pass timing and all this other stuff. Same thing again for gearboxes, gear motors, all sorts of stuff. What, how do right. you address that? Well, I mean, first of all, it's important to understand that an IA who does that is operating within his discretion. IAs, the reason they pay IAs the big bucks is to make <laughs> make these determinations, you know. Uh, but it's also important to understand that that sort of an, an airworthiness determination that is based on a subjective opinion of whether something is is in condition for safe flight or not um, is just an opinion, and mm -hmm. so the the best way to to break that deadlock is to find somebody else who has a different opinion, who's got sufficient stature and authority that your mechanic is likely to pay attention to him. And you know if you if 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 that fails and the mechanic says, well, I don't care what anybody says, this is, you know, I'm not going to sign this off. I'm just not comfortable with it. That Then then your get out of jail free card is to direct him to sign off the annual with a discrepancy and and then get get somebody else to, to clear the discrepancy. And And is that usually... Like you mentioned, in some cases, that can be an inspection of it. Um, when you have a client uh, uh, that you run up against something that's simply based on hours mm -hmm. and not being opened up, overhauled, IRAND, whatever is appropriate, it could be anything from a pr propeller to a gear motor to to whatever. How do you ha how do you usually handle handle getting it added back? Get you know it, how do you handle it at the new shop? Taking I'm not, mags I'm not, over, so so someone's left a shop. You 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 couldn't convince the uh, the the shop that did the annual inspection to, that it was okay to have 600 hours on the mags without being inspected, or uh, a, a, a thousand hours over on on some other uh, uh, component that without being a uh, manufacturer's recommended overhaul or inspection. Um, how do you usually handle that at a new shop to get a to get an aircraft uh, airworthy again? Well, uh, I mean, the main thing is to 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 determine the shop's position on the particular issue involved before taking the airplane to them. <laughs> I mean, that's that was the solution to the TBO problem too. If you have an engine you know is over TBO, and and you're going to take it to a shop you've never used before for an annual. You really ought to interview the IA first and say, by the way, this airplane has an engine that's 400 over TB, 400 hours over TBO. You got a problem with that? And if he says, yeah, I got a problem with that, then you don't take it to him for an annual. But, <laughs> but you know, the the other point that we were trying to get is that even if you do, even if you wind it up in that uncomfortable situation where he says, well, I, I can't sign it off. It's over TBO. That doesn't mean that 
that you're over a barrel, it doesn't mean that you have to do what the IA says. You can just tell them to sign off the annual with a discrepancy. Um, right. But we, you know, the it, it, it sort of depends. You're talking about magnetos, for example. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty strong believer in, in doing not an overhaul, but at least a, a, an IRAN on magnetos yep. every 500 hours. I think that's a good thing to do. Absolutely. And so if, if I have a client with mags that are at 600 hours and the shop says, you know, we, 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 we need to overhaul the mags, I'll say, well, probably not overhaul them, but at least let's do an IRAN and here's a good place to send them to and they'll do it for $300 a magneto. Yep. But, uh, w I mean, I, we once had a shop that that said we, we have to replace the mags because they're more than four calendar years old. Now there is a, a Continental Service bullet that, that says for Bendix mags that they should be overhauled at four calendar years. But that's totally stupid because there's nothing <laughs> in mags that, that, that know about calendar time. Well, that's not true. They're, they're, how, do you, how do you really feel about it? <laughs> the capacitors know about calendar time and, and, and they typically go about 20 years before they fail. But, but the idea that you should overhaul a mag at every four years doesn't make any sense. 500 hours, it makes sense. So, you know, we pushed back on the shop and the shop came up with this argument that said that we're required by regulation to, to do this. Right. And we said, no, you're not. Sign it off as a, as a right. discrepancy. And we, you know, we had another mechanic sign off the magnetos um, and they were well, oh, they were well under 500 hours. They just happened to be over four years. And yep. That was you know, insane. another another thing that plays right into that, and quite a few questions came in beyond there, is again, it, it's an inspection at that moment, at that time, and there seems to be a lot of uh, push back and forth using this term airworthiness, which does not seem to apply to things that are soon to be out of limits. But right, not you know, that's right interesting now. that um, it, I I I've, I've been down to Australia a few times and and uh, in Australia the um, when a mechanic does an inspection he's required to write up anything that he finds that although it is airworthy now he does he thinks it will not remain airworthy for the till the next schedule inspection which is an interesting concept uh, so he has to predict the future. I guess I guess Australian uh, they they call them lameys down there, L A M E licensed something uh, engineers. But anyway, I guess they I guess they're issued uh, crystal balls by the by <laughs> by, by, by Kaza. Like they've got steel ones. Uh, but but in the U S. it doesn't work that way. And when 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 a uh, when an IA signs off an inspection, it, it's it's a it represents a an airworthiness snapshot at the moment he signs it off. Uh, right. Or the the way uh, Bill O'Brien of the FAA used to term it, he says he says the inspection is good until the ink dries. <laughs> <laughs> like um, and so it, you know, getting back to our brake discs, if the brake disc is is mic'd and it's 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 one thousandth over the minimum limit. Um, you know the reasonable thing for the IA to do is to say to the owner, you know this mic disc is only a thousand a thousandth over the minimum limit. Um, you might want to consider replacing it now rather than having to put the airplane up on jacks and pull the wheel off and something you know a couple of months from now. But you don't have to. It's up to you. Right. And and um, and most importantly, go back to the very beginning of what you were saying. That's a memo, right? That's not a discrepancy. Yes. Right. That's right. The, the 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 what I called a memo. We we normally actually call a work order. Okay. That's really the name of the document that that goes back and forth between the shop and the aircraft owner. Um, but it is a memo. It's not. It's non-regulatory. It doesn't get. You know, it, it it doesn't get preserved. It's not part of the maintenance records. It's just informal, so, and, and ultimately gets magically turned into an invoice at the end of the process. But it's not it's not a regulatory thing. Whereas the logbook entries, the forty three eleven discrepancy lifts, if there is one, that sort of thing, those are regulatory documents. 
Yep. So bottom line here, and then I want to hear about your services that you do, because people need a lot of help in this regard. I think it saves them huge amounts of money with what you do. And, and, but really, this is about uh, asserting your, not just your rights, but your responsibilities as the aircraft owner or operator to make sure that this inspection's done and that you ask the right questions and they're producing their justifications, almost proof of why these are discrepancies, keeping them out and keeping them separate from the annual inspection. Right. You know, the, 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 the regulations give aircraft owners an enormous amount of responsibility and an enormous amount of authority to go along with that responsibility. And, and most aircraft owners don't really realize that they're in a very powerful position. They, they they mostly think of themselves more as being victims than as as being in control. But but if you look at it from a regulatory standpoint, the the, the aircraft owner is in a very very powerful position. But the, there's a there's a a peculiar thing. You know, almost everything that we do in aviation, whether it's you know being a pilot, being a mechanic, being an air traffic controller, being a parachute rigger, you know, we, we, we go through training and testing and certification and, and, uh, and recurrent training and stuff. But what is arguably the hardest job in aviation, which is being an aircraft owner, there is no certification for, you know, you, you become an aircraft owner by writing a check. Right. That's the only requirement. Right, you and, have to be a pilot. <laughs> and, and, the, and, and the minute you write that check, you suddenly take on this mantle of, of responsibility for airworthiness for which you have had no training typically. And, and so, you know, that's a, a, I think a really good argument could be made that, that aircraft owners should, should have to have an aircraft owner certificate that, that, that means that they've gone through some training and been tested that they actually know uh, about the job of being a, an aircraft owner and 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 what what your responsibilities and authorities are because I, I i i think aircraft owners typically don't really understand where the where where the line is drawn between what they're responsible for and where, what their mechanics are responsible for yeah and and That's the only way to solve point. that is 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 training, you know. And I, I've written some books on the subject and stuff, but uh, it, it that's a, I think that's kind of a real hole in our system that that mm. that aircraft owners aren't properly trained to be aircraft owners. Now, if you're that that's part ninety one aircraft owners. If you're a if you're another kind of aircraft owner, a part one thirty five or a part one twenty four one, you go through all sorts of hell. To, to 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 do that but part right. 91 aircraft owners all they have to do is write a check and they magically become part 91 aircraft owners w without really any training for for taking on that job yep new aircraft owners and new parents none of them get manuals or instructions <laughs> <laughs> parents good good point very very similar so mike one other thing uh before uh, we, we talk about savvy and that is um at the end of maintenance from a practical standpoint, not even just a, a regulation standpoint, from a practical standpoint, uh, do you usually expect shops to be the ones to, to, be, to fly the aircraft, to, to, to do that post-maintenance checkout of the aircraft after maintenance? My experience is that very few shops do post-maintenance uh, flights. Um, some of the very best ones do. And uh, you know, one of one of the other things I always say is if I if I was ever FA administrator for a day, which isn't going to happen, um, uh, that that I would change the rules so that the IA who signs off an annual inspection has to ride along on the first flight, because I think it would give them some incentive. <laughs> uh, but but my experience is that. Very few shops uh, do uh, uh, post-maintenance test flights. They rely on the aircraft owner to do that. 
and um, uh, I, I even the, the, I'm thinking of a particular mechanic who who is a an, a mentor of mine, and uh, who I was talking about him uh, talking to him one day because he is pilot rated, and I said you 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 test fly your customers' airplanes. Uh, or do you go up with the with the with the customer on you know on a post maintenance test flight? And he says, y y usually I don't. And then he paused for a minute and he says, and it's not the airplane I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good point. Exactly. But but uh, on the other hand, I, th there's a particularly good shop that, that we work with a lot up, up in the Sacramento area uh, that makes it a standard practice to have one of their professional pilots uh, fly the airplane bef uh, before it's delivered to a customer after maintenance. Yep, that makes which a lot I, of sense. Which I, which I think is a, is a very good thing to do, but it's it's pretty rare. So, so Mike, uh, uh, before we go, t tell us about the services that uh, that you provide over at Savvy, because obviously a lot of people could use some advocacy, uh, whether it be through just getting questions or through Savvy Maintenance. Well, we, we have a, a palette of different services that we provide, um, and uh, actually we've got a website that describes them pretty well, uh, SavvyAviation.com. The, the, the original thing we started the company doing 12 years ago was was professionally managed maintenance, where uh, you sign up for the, that's a, the service we call Savvy MX, where you sign up for the service, you're assigned uh, an IA uh, to basically be your maintenance representative and yep. to uh, work with the shops, give them marching orders, um, and, and, and uh, basically be in, in your maintenance life, what your lawyer might be, or your, you know, real estate yep. agent, a realtor might be, or your uh, your tax guy might be, that he he basically is your representative, and and that's that's what we do with with uh, with Savvy MX. Um, since then, we've diversified quite a bit, and we we have a lot of other services that we offer in addition to Savvy MX. Savvy QA is our consulting service. It, and it it it's somewhat similar to Savvy MX, except that um, that we interface only with the aircraft owner. We don't interface with the shops. And so right. aircraft owners that prefer to handle the interface with the shops themselves um, typically are a better fit for Savvy QA. Yep. And then you have breakdown service as well and pre buys, we, correct? Right, we do we do a lot of pre buys. In fact, we've had an explosion of pre buys in the last few months. Um, this COVID thing seems to have created a gigantic wave of turnover of aircraft. An awful lot of aircraft are being bought and sold all of a sudden, and we've never seen anything like it. Wow. And so we we historically have typically been managing like. 10 simultaneous pre-buys at any given time. And now we're managing 50. It's just amazing. Wow. That's just awesome. Amazing. And and the good news is we're also seeing that, you know, we're not we're not seeing aircraft values tank at the same time. It's actually a healthy market of turnover. Yeah, un unless un unless you're one of the people that was forced to sell your aircraft because of, of because COVID closed down your yes. business. Oh, no um, question. But at least we were at least most values from what we've been tracking and the people I've been talking about in the industry are not not tanking uh, mm -hmm. uh, in general. So in addition to those three, we've got two other services. We we, we do a a lot. Probably a third of our business is uh, is in the area of what we call savvy analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a a, a, a digital platform. Uh, to which engine monitor data uh, can get uploaded. Um, and that data goes through a lot of um, algorithmic analysis that's automatic, looking for bad things and flagging them. And, and then we have a, a staff of, I think it's like eight professional analysts who all, all they do is, is look at that data and uh, analyze it, write up reports for aircraft owners. 
uh, we issue report cards to the aircraft owners. Uh, we issue trend uh, analysis reports on the air to the aircraft owners. Uh, just a lot of high-powered stuff that comes out of that engine monitor data. That's the savvy analysis part of our business. And finally, we 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 have a a breakdown assistance, a 24/7 breakdown assistance program, which is basically like AAA for general aviation. Yeah, that's great. Um, where if you're on a trip and and you have a problem with the airplane away from home, uh, you can call a a, a hotline uh, any time of the day or night, and within a few minutes you'll be in in touch with one of our IAs, and we'll talk you through a diagnosis, and then uh, try to make a determination as to whether the issue that you have is is a safety of flight issue or whether you can continue your trip or at least fly to some place where you can have it fixed. Uh, and if it is a safety of flight issue, then we do whatever is required to to get it resolved. And if you want to if you want to rent a car or something and continue your trip, uh, we'll we'll take care of getting your airplane fixed. Excellent. Well, Mike, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. As always, it is a fantastic discourse, uh, so, so much to learn, and uh, I hope you'll come back soon. Absolutely, Jeff. I enjoy these. Yeah, I like, like having it as a regular thing. So for everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We, again, as always, have some great programs continuing as part of Social Flight Live next week on Tuesday, uh, on the October 27th, Tuesday at 8 p.m. as always. John Williams is here from Titan Aircraft. We're then going to take a week off uh, for election night happening after that on Tuesday, but we're going to be back with what everyone needs after the election, which is a little bit of humor and entertainment on November 10th with Rod Machado. And uh -huh. so uh, we'll do that. We've got a cool tools night coming up on November 17th. So please stay with us. As long as you are subscribed to Social Flight Live, you'll keep here uh, with all the program updates. And we're just going to keep this program going, supporting general aviation during the crisis and beyond, which has been all of our calls from the very beginning. Again, Mike Bush, CEO of Savvy Aviation. Thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody, for coming. All right, blue skies, everyone.